You want to get out your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19 is where we'll be studying from. So good to be here today and see so many here. Uh, some of you visitors, we, we especially want you to feel welcomed here and hope that uh, you're, you're able to worship with us and, and get a lot out of this worship service. Uh, if you have any questions about anything that's going on here and you need to ask those, uh, there's, there's plenty of members here that would be happy to speak with you about that. Uh, and ho- Hopefully you'll stick around so we can connect with you a little bit. Uh, as, was, as Tommy said, we did get moved to Satsuma yesterday, and uh, I feel very old. Uh, my body is, is hurting still, uh, and I didn't even do the heavy work. We had some young guys that did an amazing job lifting a lot of the heavy pieces and even taking them upstairs to our house. So, um, so appreciative of the love and the generosity of those who sacrificed their Saturdays to, to help us get moved in. And we look forward to having you guys over to our house, not to work, but to uh, have Bible studies and to, to spend time together in fellowship. So thank you for that. What would it take for you to sacrifice the truth for something that's false? How much would it cost? What is the price? Truth is something that... Uh, we have to be completely devoted to, and many of us think we are devoted to the truth. But sometimes it's easy to get caught up in what we really want or the misinformation that's all around us uh, and get pulled away from the truth. So what would it take for us to sacrifice the truth, allow the truth to be distorted, or maybe present the truth in a way that allows us to have our cake and eat it too, so to speak. What would it take for us to do that? In today's message, we're going to look at three stories from the book of Acts, where we see men making the choice to sacrifice the truth and believe a lie. And I think as we study through that, we're going to learn some valuable lessons about uh, ourselves and maybe our tendencies to believe lies in our life uh, and how easy it is for us to just let go of the truth so that we can enjoy a lie uh, and, and the importance of us not doing that. To start off with, if you're there with me in Acts chapter 19, uh, we're going to read in verse 8, starting in verse 8. Uh, if you remember, this is Paul in Ephesus. He's been uh, preaching and teaching in Ephesus and finding great success in Ephesus uh, to a certain extent. Um, or, or His disciples have, Aquila and Priscilla and Apollos have. They've, they've even created a small congregation there before he gets there. But whenever he comes, this is him preaching in verse 8. It says, he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks." As we look at this text, we see Paul trying to persuade the Ephesian Jews like we've seen him trying to persuade the Jews everywhere. He's gone into the synagogue and he's reasoned with them and he's explained the gospel to them. And again, some have stubbornly rejected the truth of the gospel. And in this case, it says something interesting. It says they speak evil of the way. Here's Paul sharing the good news. The Messiah has come. Jesus, what is the Messiah? He died on the cross. He was resurrected. God demonstrated his choice of Jesus as the Messiah, his power over death by raising him from the dead. And they speak about Paul that he is in some way evil. And the things that he's saying are evil. The good news is evil. Isn't that interesting? that they would speak that way about the the most wonderful news. They've been waiting for this Messiah to come, and we've seen this happen over and over and over again. They rejected the truth, and then they wanted to kill, kill Paul. They wanted to attack him, but now they're saying this way is evil. And if Paul is deceiving them, then maybe it is evil. 
But Paul has provided over the course of three months proof after proof of the existence of Jesus and, and how many witnesses have witnessed him resurrecting from the dead after many witnesses witnessed him dying on the cross. He is truly the Son of God. But they have rejected him as being the Son of God because him not being the Son of God is more appealing to them than him being the Son of God. For some reason, a lie is more appealing to them than the truth. Have you ever felt that way? Has there ever been an occasion in your life when uh, you heard something, deep down you knew it was true, but you didn't want to believe it? Because if it was true, then that would mean a lot of things would have to change. And we don't really like to change some things. Some things we would much rather keep the same. And so we believe lies based on our feelings. How many of us have, have had this feeling of discomfort when someone tells us something we're doing wrong? <laughs> or they critique us. I mean, we don't like that. That doesn't feel good. And so as someone tells the truth to us, we might feel like that can't be true because I don't want it to be true. <laughs> and and, and I, it doesn't feel good to me if that's true. Maybe I know the consequences of the truth would be greater in my mind than the benefits of believing the truth. So, so I need to disprove it or I need to just reject it in some way. It has to be untrue, it's evil now, and we're going to believe that the opposite has to be true. Jesus is not the Son of God in this case. Jesus is not the Messiah. He did not raise from the dead. This is all a hoax. And what it boils down to with all of these Jews that we've been reading about stubbornly rejecting the gospel, what it boils down to is deep down inside there is a fear. A fear that believing this would mean that they'd have to change everything about how they've been living and how they've been believing the world is. Because you see, the Jews and all of their beliefs that they've concocted and all of their traditions that they've developed over the years, they've gone away from what God really cares about. And they've made much about things that God doesn't care anything about. And they're really good at those things. And the things that God really cares about, they've made little of. And they would much rather just not make those changes. There's heart changes that would be needed. They would have to appear humble and lowly instead of proud and arrogant. They would have to appear to be wrong in many ways that Jesus taught that was against their traditions and their way of doing things. They would have to lower themselves and they don't like that. Well, we don't like that either. I mean, just being honest, we don't like that either. We don't like to be lessened in the eyes of people around us. And being wrong means we're not as good as maybe we're trying to appear to be. So the lies appeal to us more than the truth. And this is why we reject the truth. As, as I said, what will you sacrifice for the truth? Well, what will it take for you to sacrifice the truth for a lie? Well, in this case, it just takes discomfort. And it takes losing some reputation. And that's all it takes. And if, if, I, have to, if I have to change things, then I'm going to believe a lie rather than submitting to the truth. I can't. Submit to that truth. I have to, I have to believe a lie. Well, now let's talk about the third story. We're going to go from the first story to the third story because it just fits better uh, in the flow of things. Second story has a happy ending. I like to end on a happy ending, so we'll, we'll end with the second story. All right, so if you skip down to verse 21, you'll notice while Paul is preaching in Ephesus, he's, remember he's left the Jews because they rejected, and he's taken some of them with him to start 
preaching in a school. Well, it turns out in Ephesus, he's had great success with the Gentiles. There are so many Gentiles accepting and believing the truth. And as a result of that, everything's changing in Ephesus. The whole society, the whole culture is changing in a way that affects people's finances. And there's a man in this story named Demetrius. Demetrius is a uh, silversmith. He's a craftsman. He worked to build the idols for the goddess Artemis, who is, who is, they have a temple in Ephesus that everybody travels to this area to go and to see this temple. And so uh, he is uh, a, a silversmith who builds these little carved uh, images that, that get sold. And there's other craftsmen with him. And they don't like the fact that Paul has had such great success with the Gentiles. So Demetrius gets all those craftsmen together and they attempt a coup. They attempt to overthrow the Christians and Paul and all of his work. They want to stop it. So they rile up a crowd. And listen to what happens. Verse verse 25 beginning, it says, Then he gathered together, this is Demetrius, gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with the hands are not gods. Can you imagine the audacity? And they're in danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. And when they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! So the city was filled with confusion And they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, who were Paul's companions in travel. So we'll stop there. Notice that Demetrius has riled up the crowds in this theater to say, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. They're so focused on what they're known for. They're so focused on... Uh, the the popularity that they've gained because of this temple and because of all the things that they've been working for and working toward all their lives. And they care so much about their identity that they're willing to reject the truth. But really, as we study this and you look at the first of this, you learn it's really about the money. You see, the truth sometimes hurts our our pocketbooks, makes it to where we have to give up money and and makes it to where we lose money. And so they're not too happy about that, right? These silversmiths, their livelihood is tied up in these idols that are now useless because they're useless, because nobody's putting value in it anymore. And so they want to believe the lies because the truth hurts their finances. It makes it to where they can't buy the things they want. They're not as wealthy as they once were. Can you imagine this? Imagine in our society if people were willing to believe the truth so much that they changed their lives. That they actually put their faith and trust in Jesus and they put away the sinful things that they've been pursuing all their lives. I mean, think about how many businesses would go broke as a result of this. Pornography business would be gone, right? Non-existent. How wonderful would that be? But also other businesses. I mean, psychiatrists and counselors. I mean, relationships would be mended uh, that were once broken because those who put their faith and trust in God and Christ are seeking to love others. And, and, and not attack them out of selfish ambition and rivalry. So there'd just be a number of areas in life where the businesses would just dry up because 
people are acting like Christ acted. And, and really, a lot of the businesses in our society, the lawyers, uh, the marketing experts, all those, all those people would have to completely rethink their jobs because a lot of their jobs are blossoming because sin's all over the place. It's rampant. Imagine how upset they'd be if they lost their money. How would you feel if your business dried up because people started to change and believe what is true? Would you be okay with that? Would you be okay with having to completely restructure your life and all the work that you've always done in your life to have to go out and to learn a new trade, maybe later on in life? That's huge, right? That's a motivator. Money may be a motivator for us to want to believe a lie rather than to submit to what is actually true. We might sacrifice the truth in that case. Because ooh, we need our money. We need our comforts and our luxuries in life. Now let's go back to that second story. In the second story, it's interesting because it has this happy ending. But it's also interesting because it's just a funny story. You see, there's a, a time there in Ephesus when Paul is extremely successful, not just with spreading the gospel, but because there's so much faith, it seems as though he's successful in doing miraculous signs and miracles, uh, healing people, casting out demons. God gave him great power in Ephesus so that uh, his word was being believed and submitted to uh, across the board, all over the place. And so people were coming and, and getting a handkerchief and taking it to the sick person. If they just touched the handkerchief, that person was being healed. And so Paul had great power and great authority in Ephesus. We don't read about him having that kind of power as he's gone to other places. I imagine there was some of it, but really, this is amazing, the amount of power that he was given. And it became so known and so notable that Notice what happened when some traveling Jewish exorcists show up in Ephesus. Look at verse 13. It says, Then some of the itinerant, that's traveling, uh, Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the, by G, by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of the Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirits leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Just, that's in the Bible. That's amazing. That's hilarious, right? These guys go in there, and they're ready to cast out these demons, and they've got a new trick up their sleeve. They, ah, Paul's got this down. He just, he just says these words. So they go in there, and they say the same kind of words, and, and they say, by the name of Jesus and the power of Jesus, but whom Paul proclaims, I command you to be cast out of them. And the Spirit talks back to them. Jesus I know. Paul, I'm familiar with. That's fascinating. The demons know who Paul is. I'm familiar with Paul. But who are you? See, they don't, they don't do well in this situation because they hadn't fully submitted themselves to the truth. They want the blessings while living in disobedience. They want the blessings while living in disobedience. They want to have the power and the authority that Paul has while still rejecting what is true. That's interesting. They still love their traditions. They still love all the things that they've done before. And they now think, well, we can just partially accept the truth and then accept some lies, right? 
Well, have you ever done that? Has anybody ever done that? Of course we've done that. Do we know people who've done that? Well, sure. That's, that's why you know, our country is so full of people who don't go to church anymore. That's why our church buildings are becoming more and more empty. Because there's a lot of people that believe that it's not important for us to assemble as long as we just kind of do a few things and, and we're kind of partially, they kind of partially accept the truth without really giving themselves over to what is true. They're not really submitting their lives to Christ. They're just hoping to get some of the blessings for themselves and to, to, to enjoy that relationship. But notice, these guys who had not joined themselves to, to the church, to the body of Christ, they've not submitted to Christ, they've not given God their lives, they connect with the spiritual realm and they find they're naked and wounded. They're, un, they're, they're, they're not connected to God. They don't have the relationship that they think that they have. And because of that, the spiritual realm is able to attack them. They have no protection, as Paul does. They have no relationship that's deep because of that. And, and we ourselves, we can think, okay, well, I believe part of the truth, and I go, to, I go to church services, and we think, okay, I'm good, but we haven't really submitted to the truth yet. And we're kind of partially in and partially out. We're kind of riding the fence. We do what we want when we leave this building. We try to act right whenever we come in. We can do this same thing. And notice, that's, that too is believing a lie. If you believe part of the truth and you believe a lie, you believe the lie. You don't get away with that. You don't pull one over on God. In fact, in some ways, this is kind of the worst scenario. You're in the worst situation. Because you're not really getting any blessings and you're kind of miserable as you're trying to appear like you are. But like I said, there is a happy ending to this story. You see, after these Jews go into this place and they get beaten up, seven of them get beat up by one guy to the point where they're naked and, and wounded, people hear about that. And it says, because they hear about that, some believe. Look at verse 17. It says, this became known to all the residents of Ephesus. How embarrassing. Both Jews and Greeks. And fear fell upon all of them. And the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Notice the result of this event was believers who confessed and divulged all of their practices all of their deceptions, all of their lies. They stopped being on the fence about things. They didn't, they didn't choose to just say, okay, yeah, I believe, but I've still got to make my money with my magical practices and services, so I'm still going to offer those. No, they said, we're done, and we don't know what the future is going to hold because this is the way we lived, and this is the way we made our money, and this is the way we enjoyed life, and now we can't do that anymore, but we believe. And we believe enough to submit everything to God, to give our lives to Him. That's a happy ending. They sacrificed the lies for the truth. Don't you imagine that was hard? But don't you imagine that was wonderful? I bet there was a lot of joy in watching those flames burn up all of those books and finally accepting the truth that sets them free. Knowing that there's real power in the name of Jesus, unlike anything they've ever experienced. It's an amazing, amazing turnaround as we see in these uh, Gentile 
people that they would believe to that point of confessing all that they've done for everybody to know and to glorify the name of Jesus as being the name that is the one that they will follow and that everyone should follow. Let's talk about some lessons learned and just kind of review some of these things. Uh, The truth is, there's a lot of different responses to the truth. People believe, in a lot of cases, what they want to believe. They believe what feels good to them. They believe what they think their parents would want them to believe. They believe what uh, gives them a a more comfortable life and, and they believe a certain way to try to avoid discomfort, to, to, to try to avoid changing things and messing up the comfortable, easygoing life that they're going through. And a lot of times we, we want to think that we can believe a partial truth and then also believe a lie. But that's the worst situation. Because we're really just fighting ourselves. We know what the truth is and we're just we're refusing to submit to it. That's just a miserable life to live we see it's better for us to just accept the truth and walk in the truth rather than to believe a lie if you know john three sixteen, for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but shall inherit eternal life you know the words that follow for god did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. That's the truth, and it's wonderful. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. That's exactly what we're seeing happen as these magicians come and they burn their books. That's exactly what we're seeing happen as these people reject the light. They love the darkness. They're more content with living in the lie than they are with exposing the truth of their sin and their guilt and letting God's truth change their lives. Well, what about us? Will we accept what is false without examining the evidence? Will we continue to believe what is comfortable or will we believe a lie that makes us feel good and makes us feel like everything's okay and we're going to be safe now, knowing it's a lie? Do we think the truth is something that we just know in our hearts? I can't tell you how many times I've heard that and heard that promoted in our society. Just believe what's in your heart. Just follow your heart. Every Disney movie. Basically, that's the message. Truth doesn't come from our hearts. Our hearts are easily corrupted by the deceitfulness of sin. We want to compromise what is true and believe a lie to make our lives easier. And when we do that, Our hearts become hardened to the point where we call evil good and good evil. To the point where people who are trying to do what's right, we fight against them and we reject everything that they stand for. We must understand truth is more valuable. Truth is more valuable than whatever it is that we're fighting to keep. Really, as we look at the Bible as a whole, we see that this is the most important thing. There is not anything more valuable than belief. And this is where the battleground is. Satan is choosing to fight with us on this battleground. What is true and what is not? 
And so we have to defend ourselves from all the deceitfulness of lies that he's throwing at us, that, that people around us are throwing at us that they believed, and lies that come up within ourselves that we want to believe because we hate what's true, because it makes us uncomfortable. And so that's a battle that we all have to face. And we have to overcome the lies and believe the truth because we have to know the truth is more important than anything else. Believing the truth is the only thing that will make it possible for us to have eternal life. It's the only thing. Whoever believes in him. Our goal in life is to believe in him and to sacrifice what we, what we want and what we desire to follow and serve him. And that's the question we have to ask ourselves. Is that what we're willing to do? Are we willing to love the truth? Or will we sacrifice the truth for a lie? I hope that as you hear this, you're not thinking about other people as much as you're thinking about yourself and, and making sure that the things that you believe are true. And if there's something that's in your life that you know is a lie, I hope that you'll stop believing a lie. I know there's discomfort in that. I know that there's suffering and, and pain as a result of believing what's true and actually submitting to it and giving ourselves to it. But that's why we gather together to encourage one another in that very effort. Don't let Satan win. Believe what's true. Receive the grace that God is offering to you. D divulge your practices. Confess your sins. Lay it all out there in the light exposed for everybody to see and then from that point forward walk in the light and enjoy the fruit of love that comes from God that can be yours today if you need to do that will you please come as we stand and as we sing